Welcome to the Ship Gold Friday Gold Wrap, your overview of news impacting the precious metals markets. It's Friday, November 10th. I'm your host, Mike Meharry. Thanks for tuning in. The road to prosperity is paved with credit cards. At least that's the impression you get listening to Joe Biden and Jerome Powell and financial news network pundits gushing over this strong economy. They keep talking about the resilient consumer still spending money and robust GDP growth. But of course, a lot of this so-called prosperity is being brought to you by Visa and MasterCard and American Express and Discover too. Think about it for a minute. If you pulled up to my $2 million mansion and saw a Rolls Royce and a Ferrari sitting in the driveway, you'd probably be impressed. And what if I came out and greeted you wearing an expensive suit and a Rolex watch? Even more impressed, right? And what if I took frequent expensive vacations and always had the latest gadgets? You'd assume, man, that Meharry guy's got it going on. Now, how would your opinion change if you found out that my house was mortgaged to the hilt, I was two months late on my car payments, and I was buried under $100,000 in credit card debt? You most likely wouldn't think I've got it going on. You would undoubtedly conclude that my prosperity is an illusion. And this is exactly where America is today. Mainstream financial network pundits and government officials and academic economists, they keep telling us that the economy is chugging along because Americans continue to spend money. They base their whole notion of economic growth on people spending money to buy stuff. But it's clear that borrowing is the only thing sustaining this spending spree. Meanwhile, the resilient American consumer is drowning under a surging tidal wave of debt. Total household debt rose by $228 billion in the third quarter, setting a new record of, get this, $17.29 trillion. This according to the latest data from the New York Federal Reserve. Surging credit card balances led the way, increasing by 4.7% in the quarter to a record $1.08 trillion. Year-on-year, credit card debt spiked by $154 billion. It was the biggest annual increase since 1999. Of course, credit cards are the most expensive way to borrow money, especially with the Federal Reserve jacking up interest rates to fight price inflation. So you're getting the double whammy of rising debt and rising interest rates. Average credit card interest rates eclipsed the previous record high of 17.87% months ago. The average annual percentage rate currently stands at 20.72%. Now, according to the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, Americans paid $130 billion in interest and fees on their credit cards over the last year. That was the largest amount on record. Now, think about that. That's $130 billion that's just going to pay interest. Nobody's buying anything with that. Nobody's investing anything with that money. Nothing's being produced. It's just going into the pockets of bankers. Oh, on a side note about that war on inflation that the Fed is fighting, you know, not too long ago, Paul Krugman declared it was over, and he said, we won. Well, I'm here today to tell you that Paul Krugman is full of crap. I got my car insurance renewal this week. It's going up 39%, and that's on top of a 10% increase that we just got six months ago. Now, I guarantee you that the huge increase will not be reflected in any CPI calculation anywhere. Just like the huge increase in the price of buying a home or renting a place is understated by the CPI formula. I talked about, I think two weeks ago, about how badly these government formulas understate price inflation. Um, If you haven't heard that, you might want to check out that episode because I actually explain some of the reasons that these these, uh, formulas are problematic. But yeah, inflation, alive and well. Now, I mean, 
I really shouldn't be complaining, right? I mean, Krugman says, I have it good. I just don't realize it. I mean, if you strip out food, shelter, and housing, that CPI is actually around 2%. That's the target, right? So really, I can solve the price inflation problem all by myself. Just don't have car insurance. Oh, and I should also quit eating food and driving my car or something. Anyway, back to the household debt. Basically, what happened was Americans paid down their credit cards and saved a bunch of money thanks to all of the stimulus flowing during the pandemic. So we saw a big drop in credit card balances. We saw a big increase in savings during that time. But once the government shut the COVID stimulus spigot off and transitory inflation started gripping the economy, Americans proceeded to blow through their savings in order to make ends meet. Aggregate savings peaked at $2.1 trillion in August 2021. As of June, the San Francisco Fed estimated that aggregate savings had dropped to $190 billion. I know it's hard to kind of grasp these numbers when you're listening, but basically what I just said is Americans ate away $1.9 trillion, with a T, in savings in just two years. Wiped it out. Meanwhile, the personal saving rate currently has dropped through the floor, lowest levels in a long time. So, with no more stimulus and no more savings, people turn to credit cards. Here's a quote from Villanova University finance professor John uh, Sedanov. Uh, He said this to ABC News, People have to deal with this somehow. After blowing through savings to buy essentials, they do what's next, find sources to borrow. And New York Fed economic research advisor Dong Hoon Lee, um, in the press release that the Fed released when they uh, put out the household debt data, he also credited the resilience of the American consumer to Visa and MasterCard. He said, quote, credit card balances experienced a large jump in the third quarter, consistent with strong consumer spending and real GDP growth. Think about what he's saying. We're hearing all about how the economy is strong because people are spending money, there's strong consumer spending, retail sales are high, and we have real strong GDP growth. But what Mr. Lee is telling us is that this is just a reflection of credit card balances, or I I guess I'm not putting that the right way. What I mean is the only reason that we're seeing this is because people are borrowing money. Credit card balances are growing consistent with the strong consumer spending and real GDP growth. Debt.com chairman Howard Dvorkin told CNBC, quote, consumers are maintaining and supporting their lifestyles using credit card debt. So, in other words, what I'm getting at here is the economic growth that President Biden and others keep bragging about is merely a function of borrowing money. Now, in what world does this add up to a strong economy? I'll give you a hint, there is no world where that happens, unless maybe some Keynesian fantasy world, right? This economy is not strong at all. It is an illusion of prosperity created by debt. Now, never forget this fundamental truth. The problem with debt is that you have to pay it back, right? I mean, you're basically spending future earnings before you get them, right? When you use a credit card, you are spending money today that you don't have, promising to pay it back with income that you gain in the future, right? You're paying dearly for the privilege, by the way, with a 20 plus percent interest rate. But you're, you're basically pushing the payment into the future. You're buying now, pay later. So what happens in the future? Well, unless you're a government and you can print money, and you're probably not, you're going to either have to borrow more money to pay off the debt that you've run up, or you're going to have to drastically cut your spending in order to service your debt. So when you have a large pile of credit card debt, growing credit card debt, what that tells you is that in the future, you're going to see less consumer spending because people are going to be busy paying that debt back, right? And most of the time, you see that happen during a recession. Now, the other problem is credit cards have this inconvenient thing that we call a limit. And when you hit that point, well, you know. 
And there are some signs that we're at that point now and that this debt fueled spending spree is at least slowly winding down. After rising by over 13% in August, revolving credit growth, and that's primarily credit card balances, slowed to 2.9% in September. Uh, the data on consumer debt lags by two months. So we just got the consumer, or we just got the September data, and it slowed down to 2.9%. So people put their credit cards in their pocket to some degree in September. So, this could signal a significant slowdown in spending, and that would mean an end to the mythical strong economic growth, right? Because when the borrowing stops, the economic growth is going to stop too, because that's what's fueling it. Now, Americans aren't just borrowing using credit cards. Every other category of debt also increased in the third quarter. Mortgage balances rose by $126 billion from the previous quarter, and they stood at $12.14 trillion at the end of September. Now, interestingly, we saw this big increase in mortgage balances despite a drop in new mortgage originations, and that reflects the rapidly increasing mortgage rates. So as mortgage rates are going up, fewer people are buying homes, and you're, you're seeing a, a slowdown in new mortgages, but balances are still rising at a significant rate, which is a kind of an interesting dynamic that's going on. It tells you that the price of housing is still high. And despite the higher interest rates, more Americans appear to be tapping into their home equity to make ends meet. Balances on home equity lines of credit increased by $9 billion, and uh, outstanding balances now stand at $349 billion. So these are people taking second mortgages out. Um, you know, Sometimes people do that in order to make an addition or improvements to the home. A lot of times people will just pull money out of their house to pay bills or, you know, deal with some type of uh, emergency expense. So we're seeing an uptick in that as well. Auto loan balances rose by $13 billion, and uh, people now owe $1.6 trillion on auto loans. And again, this is a dynamic reflecting the rapidly increasing price of vehicles. We've seen uh, a, a rapid growth in auto loan debt really since 2011. And Again, we're seeing just this massive increase in prices. You know, I see cars advertised at, you know, forty, fifty thousand dollars. That's like double what I paid for my first house. Um, I mean, obviously my first house wasn't, you know, any kind of mansion or anything, but still, you know, back in the nineties I could buy a house for twenty five, thirty thousand uh, dollars. today you have to shell out that amount of money to buy a car that's gonna break down in four or five years. Um, let's see what else. We've got outstanding student loan debt. That increased by uh, another $30 billion. And uh, student loan debt stands at $1.6 trillion as of the end of Q3. Um, so all of that sounds bad, right? More and more debt, more and more burden on average people. Well, it gets worse because there are signs that Americans are actually starting to crack under the strain of this debt load. Delinquencies rose across all debt categories. Now, they're certainly not as bad as what we saw in the middle of the Great Recession or um, uh, you know, in, in some other economic downturns. It is actually worse than it was during the pandemic because during the pandemic, nobody had to pay back their bills. Everybody got, um, you know, they got all these uh, all this grace like on student loans and mortgages. A lot of times people didn't have to pay that and people were actually paying down debt at that point. But um, we are seeing rising delinquencies on debt. Um, it said, let's see, the, the Fed said that at the end of September, 3% of outstanding debt was in some stage of delinquency. And according to the New York Fed, delinquency transition rates increased for most debt types, except for student loans and home equity lines of credit. Um, the report noted a big jump in credit card delinquencies. That was the biggest uh, increase in delinquent debt, and particularly in the 30 to 39-year-old range. Um, the Fed economist that I quoted earlier said the continued rise in credit card delinquency rates is broad-based across area, income, and region, but particularly pronounced among millennials and those with auto loans or student loans. So, People with multiple lines of debt are having a harder time 
paying that debt makes sense, right? If you've got an auto loan, a student loan, and credit card debt, and you're paying on all of that, it's going to be more difficult. According to the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, quote, nearly one-tenth of credit card users find themselves in persistent debt. And this is a situation where they're actually being charged more in interest and fees each year than they pay toward principal. So, in effect, even if they're not borrowing more, their debt load is going up simply by the amount of uh, interest and fees that is being piled on. Um, And, of course, this pattern is increasingly difficult to break. And by the way, the only reason there hasn't been an increase in student loan delinquency is because payments have been on pause for what, three, four years? I mean, they paused them during the pandemic. So that was 2020. Um, And repayment just started last month. So that means that missed federal student loan payments are not going to be reported to credit bureaus until the fourth quarter of 2024. Um, So, yeah, we won't see that impact until later. But clearly, adding student loan payments back onto the backs of people who are already struggling to make ends meet, it's just going to exacerbate the situation. And there have been a, a number of people that have kind of done the analysis and pointed out that, especially the millennials, they're going to have a really hard time dealing with the added burden of student loan repayment on top of struggling with everything else. So, to sum all of this up, this surge in household debt basically signals that Americans are struggling to make ends meet as prices rapidly rise. I see this in my own life. And they're burying themselves in debt to keep their heads above water. The stimulus checks long gone. Savings have been depleted. The average person has no choice but to borrow more money. Debt is creating an illusion of prosperity and economic growth. So keep that in mind when these pointy heads on CNBC and over at the White House tell you how great the economy is doing. Little side note on this, I saw a, uh, it was a post on Twitter, or X, I guess it's, it's not Twitter anymore. I have, <laughs> have a really hard time letting go of Twitter and calling it X. But anyway, so there's a post on X, I think it was the, the Mises Institute, and they were responding, it was Ryan McMakin, in fact, he is the uh, executive editor at the Mises Institute, and he was responding to some guy who was pointing out that, yes, debt, credit card debt's higher, but as a proportion of the amount of money in the bank, it's really not that bad. And McMakin answered this perfectly. Those aren't the same people, right? Just because some people have managed to stash a bunch of money in the bank, you know, probably the people who are benefiting from this crazy bubble economy, like <clears throat> bankers, just because they're putting money in the bank, that doesn't help those who are buried under credit card debt. It's two different groups of people. And that's the problem with aggregate data, right? It, you kind of lose the the issues faced by the individuals. And that's why I always kind of try to, you know, every once in a while, I'll, I'll inject things like my own insurance going up. You, you know these stories. You have these stories. You know these the days that you've gone to the grocery store, you've, you've you know, seen these prices go way up, or you've seen your health insurance go up, or your, you know, whatever it is, you feel the pain of these inflationary times. And it's, that's why it's so enraging when people like Paul Krugman come along and tell you, well, you know, you're really doing okay. You know, you just don't understand how good you've got it. You know, and I just want to say, well, you know what you, because you're a jerk and you're disconnected from reality. Anyway, let's uh, take a quick look at the gold market this week. Uh, Been generally down. We've fallen well below the $2,000 an ounce resistance level that we were testing just a week ago. Gold closed on Thursday at $19.58 an ounce. Um, So, still above 1950, but uh, a long way down from, you know, the levels we were seeing just a couple of weeks ago. Um, I think the big issue here is that the geopolitical worries have kind of faded. You know, we saw a lot of safe haven buying when uh, Hamas hit Israel and Israel struck back. I think we've kind of hit the point now where the Middle East fighting is kind of 
the status quo, just like Ukraine. Um, and so some of that safe haven demand is unwinding. And I think this likely means a return to the recent trend we've seen in the price of gold, which has been basically stagnant, kind of range bound between $1,900 and $2,000 an ounce based on the latest economic data or whatever the Fed people happen to be saying. Um, speaking of Fed people saying stuff, Powell did a speech yesterday, and I guess he was moderately hawkish. He keeps emphasizing that there is no certainty that price inflation is under control. And during this speech, he said, going forward, it may be that a greater share of the progress in reducing inflation will have to come from tight monetary policy, restraining the growth of aggregate demand. So that means that if there isn't another rate hike, and I don't think most people expect there to be one, although Powell is still hinting that there could be, regardless, Powell is really trying to impress on us that rates are going to stay higher longer. keeps talking about needing this tight monetary policy. Now, of course, as I've been saying, the reality is that rates are only going to stay high until the economy cracks under the pressure. Remember, we just had an entire discussion about the massive levels of household debt. And there's also government debt and corporate debt to reckon with. The debt economy was not built for a higher interest rate environment, and it will implode. Now, mind you, interest rates really, from a historical standpoint, aren't that high. And in fact, uh, Jim Grant has made the case that if you look at a lot of the, the dynamics that the Fed uses, monetary policy is still actually technically loose, but it's tight given the amount of debt. And that's what's really important. You know, we can go back to 2006, 2007, and interest rates were at this level, basically basically where we are today. But there was much less debt. We have a lot more debt because, of course, the Fed incentivized that over the last decade with artificially low interest rates. So now we're paying the piper. Um, but I think when it becomes clear that the debt economy is going to implode, I think we can expect to see this range-bound behavior in the price of gold um, end. I think that's when we'll see the breakout, not before then. You know, I think to expect there to be a big change, given that right now everybody's still in this kind of status quo, right? Inflation, yeah, there's still a little bit of inflation, but basically it's beat. And interest rates, yeah, they're high, but that's as high as they're going to get. And we might have some economic slowdown, but we're not really going to have a recession. As long as this is the mentality, I think gold is going to stay in this area. That's that's just how I view it. Um. If you want a little more meat on the state of the economy, check out Peter Schiff's podcast this week. Um, he actually makes the case that the economy may already be in a recession, despite the GDP print that we got in the third quarter. And uh, he makes a compelling argument. I mean, you can go back to, again, 2007. The recession actually started in December 2007. And Nobody knew it, right? They actually went back and revised numbers down later on. But even well into 2008, into the summer, everybody was saying, oh, the economy's fine. Everything's great. Nobody realized what was going on until we had the financial crisis. And Peter argues that we're, we, we may well be in the same kind of uh, situation today. So check that out. I'll link to it in the show notes page. To close out the show, I want to share a little bit of silver news. Silver demand uh, for industrial applications, jewelry production, and silverware fabrication is expected to nearly double over the next 10 years. According to a report that was uh, published by Oxford Economics and uh, was commissioned by the Silver Institute, the demand in these three sectors is forecast to increase by 42% between 2023 and 2033. So, industrial jewelry and silverware production accounts for about three quarters of total silver demand. Uh, the other quarter is uh, comes from investment demand. Now, according to this report, industrial demand for silver is going to increase by forty six percent, and uh, this reflects a projected rapid fifty six percent growth in the output of the electronics industry. Um, Manufacturers of electronics and electronic 
applications are the major purchasers of industrial silver. In 2022, uh, the electronic sector consumed 371.5 million ounces of silver, and that was 67% of the total industrial offtake. According to the Silver Institute, the use of silver in solar energy and electric vehicles is going to help lead this category forward. Uh, According to a research paper by scientists at the University of New South Wales, solar manufacturers will likely require over 20% of the current annual silver supply just by the year 2027. And by 2050, solar panel production will use approximately 85 to 98 percent of the current global silver reserves. I've talked about this before. And, you know, I think, you know, in like a normal market, you probably would see a drop off in this demand for solar energy as time goes on. But governments are going to drive it, right? It's the green energy revolution. And whether you believe in all of that or not, that's where the powers that be want to take us. So I think that there's kind of a, a built-in demand for silver in this uh, green energy sector. Um, let's see. The demand for silver jewelry is projected to increase by 34% over the next decade. India uh, leads the world in silver jewelry production and will continue to do so. But the report actually forecasts that it will lose some of its dominance to China. And then we have silverware fabrication. Uh, That output is forecast to increase by 30% over the next decade. Uh, And again, a lot of that is driven by demand in India. Um, So kind of putting this in the big picture, what what I'm saying here is, is that there are significant factors that would appear to be driving silver demand higher. Let's put that into context. Silver demand set records in every single category in 2022. Meanwhile, supply was flat. Uh, Mine output dropped by 0.6%, and um, recycling increased a little bit, and it basically was a wash. So, no real increase in supply. But when you take record global silver demand, and then combine that with a lack of supply, um, there was a 237.7 million ounce market deficit in 2022. That was the second consecutive annual deficit in a row. The Silver Institute called it, quote, possibly the most significant deficit on record. And it also noted that, quote, the combined shortfalls of the previous two years comfortably offset the cumulative surpluses of the last 11 years. So over the previous 11 years, you saw basically increasing silver reserves. Uh, We saw market surpluses. All of that was wiped out in two years, and according to projections, we're going to continue to see flat to declining silver supply. Now, the fact of the matter is the price of silver does not reflect these current supply and demand dynamics, not at all. In fact, silver is significantly undervalued right now. One analyst called the current price in the $22 to $23 an ounce range, quote, inexcusably low. And if you look at the silver gold ratio, it's over 85 right now. That tells you that even compared to gold, silver is significantly undervalued. And if you're expecting a rally in the gold market, then you should expect an even bigger rally in the silver market because Generally, during a gold bull market, silver goes along for the ride and actually outperforms gold. We've seen that in the last several big bull runs with gold. We've seen silver actually increase by even more and and start to close that silver-gold ratio. Um, So that's where we are. It's important to keep in mind, too, that while silver is an industrial metal, more fundamentally, silver is money. And despite being more volatile in the short term, silver tends to track with gold over time. So again, if you're inclined to think the Federal Reserve will lose the inflation fight, you should be bullish on both gold and silver and possibly even more bullish on silver today. Um, You know, at some point, investors are going to have to reckon with this shrinking supply of silver, coupled with rising demand, along with the Fed's inability to bring inflation back to its 2% target. And I think when that happens, the price of silver will likely, if history is any indication, take off. So given the supply and demand dynamics, the skewed silver-gold ratio, and the likelihood that the Fed will not beat pricing uh, price inflation. This twenty to twenty three dollars silver right now looks like a great buying opportunity.
Now, if you're inclined to take advantage of this buying opportunity, if you're interested in investing in silver, learning more about how silver could diversify your portfolio, um, or maybe it's time to add gold to your portfolio while the price is still below $2,000 an ounce because it's not going to stay there forever, right? If you're kind of in that state of mind, this is a perfect time to talk to a Shift Gold Precious Metals specialist. You can do that simply by calling 1-888-GOLD-160. Gold-160. 888-GOLD-160. Or if you don't want to talk on the phone, I get it. You can email them, info at shiftgold.com, and somebody will respond to your email. Or you can also go online to shiftgold.com, go to the Getting Started tab, and you can actually chat online directly with a precious metal specialist. These guys are great. I say this all the time. They're going to listen to you. They're going to figure out what your needs and goals are, and they're going to help you figure out how precious metals can fit into your broader investment strategy. So do it today. Don't wait. The longer you wait, the more likely it is you're going to get held or you're going to get caught. I was going to say get caught holding the bag, but you're actually going to be not holding the bag because you're going to be wanting silver and gold and it's going to be expensive. So do that today. And with that, we're going to call it a gold wrap for the week. Now, of course, you can get more details on all of the stories that I've talked about today and more. And keep up with the latest precious metals news and analysis throughout the week over at shiftgold.com slash news. And if you haven't done it already, you know, you can subscribe to the Friday Gold Wrap. We're on Apple Podcasts, we're on Google Podcasts, uh, we're on um, we're on uh, Spotify, I believe, we're on the Shift Gold YouTube channel. Uh, you'll find links to all of those things on the show notes page. You're also welcome to email me. I love to hear from folks. M. Meharry, M. M. A-H-A-R-R-E-Y at shipgold.com. Shoot me an email and uh, I'll get back to you at some point. And um, yeah, appreciate you listening to the show. I hope you have a fantastic weekend and I will talk to you next week.